Okay, today I want to talk about the female uh, reproductive system. In this picture, uh, you can see the secondary oocyte, and these are the sperms, um, and uh, you need to know that only one sperm can penetrate to the secondary oocyte and can do fertilization. We don't have uh, polyspermy uh, at the time of fertilization, and I will talk about it uh, later for you. Uh, the female reproductive system includes different organs. We have ovaries, we have a uterine tube or fallopian tube. The other name of uterine or fallopian tube is oviduct. After that, we have a sac-like structure, which we call it a uterus. Then there is a tube, a muscular tube, uh, which is vagina, and we have uh, some organs uh, uh, which we call them external genitalia or external organs. And uh, the last part of female reproductive system is the mammary gland. Actually, the mammary gland is modified sweat gland or sudiferous gland. But because the changes which we have in the mammary gland happen during the changes in reproductive system cycle, uh, we will discuss about this gland uh, in the female reproductive system. Uh, in this picture, you can see the different organs in female reproductive system. In this picture, you can see uh, first the sagittal section, and here is uh, one of the ovaries or left ovary which you have here. Then we have a tube. This tube is called uh, oviduct or uterine tube. Uh, after that, we have this sac-like structure, which is the uterus. After the uterus, you can see the muscular tube, and this muscular tube is called vagina. And the last part of the female reproductive system is the external genitalia, as you see here. We have different functions for female reproductive system. One of them is production of secondary oocyte. Uh, the ovaries can make different hormones like progesterone, estrogen, inhibin and relaxin. And next time I will talk about these hormones for you. The um, female reproductive system can provide the site of fertilization. The fertilization takes in uh, the oviduct. And uh, we have a site for implantation of the fertilized ovum, which is the uterus. And development of the embryo and the fetus happen during pregnancy. And after that, by contraction of the uterus, we have labor or a delivery. And uh, the other function of the female reproductive system is synthesize, secrete, and ejection of the milk for nourishment of uh, the newborn. These are the different functions which we have for female reproductive system. This is uh, the anterior view of female reproductive system. In this anterior view, you can see these two uh, ovaries. Uh, these are the ovaries which we have on both sides, right and left ovary. After that, you can see this tube, uh, which is the oviduct. This oviduct has different parts. The first part of oviduct is called infundibulum and the infundibulum have many finger-like projections which are fimbria. After that we have the longest part of the oviduct, uh, we call it ampulla, and the last part of oviduct which has a thick wall is called isthmus. You need to know that the site of fertilization is the ampulla. Um, after that, we have uh, the sac uh, uterus, the sac-like uh, structure. This is the uterus, and the uterus has different parts. The first part of the uterus, the upper part, is called fundus. After that, you have the body of the uterus, and the last part of uterus is called cervix. The cervix has the other name, uh, which we call it neck of the uterus. And then you can see the vagina. Uh, 
We have different ligaments which can uh, support this uh, system in the pelvic cavity. One of uh, these ligament is called ovarian ligament. The ovarian ligament is the ligament which is located between the ovary and the uterus. The other ligament is called suspensory ligament. The suspensory ligament can help supportion of the ovary and the oviduct and attach these two organs to the wall of the pelvis. The next structure and the next ligament is this sheet ligament or broad ligament. The broad ligament has different parts. One part is located between the ovary and uh, oviduct and uterus and the other part is located between the uterus and the wall of the pelvic cavity so by these three ligaments uh, the ovarian ligament uh, the suspensory ligament and the broad ligament we can fix the female reproductive system uh, in the pelvic cavity The first the structure which I want to talk about is the ovaries. The ovaries are paired gland and they are very similar in their function uh, to the testes. They can produce gametes, the mature uh, form of uh, the oocyte, and also they can make different types of hormones. Progesterone, estrogen, inhibin, and relaxin are the hormones which are produced by the ovaries. And as I told you, they are supported by the broad ligament, ovarian ligament, and uh, suspensory ligament. Um, first, I want to talk about uh, this structure, uh, the ovaries. Histologically, we have uh, different parts in the, in the ovaries. Uh, first, um, the ovaries is covered by a germinal epithelium. This is a, the epithelium which covers the ovary from outside, and I will show you the picture of this germinal epithelium. We have a um, the capsule of the ovary, which is the tonica albogena, this is the capsule of dense irregular connective tissue, which is located below the germinal epithelium, and we have the same uh, tonica albogena around the testis too. And inside the ovary, we have uh, two important parts. One part is called ovarian cortex. The ovarian cortex is located outside and the other part is called ovarian medulla which is located inside in the ovarian cortex you can see different structures these structures are ovarian follicles in different stages of development and also we have some stromal cell the cells which can do suppression and protection of ovarian follicles and in ovarian medulla, you can see connective tissue, blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. This is uh, the picture of the ovary. As I told you, uh, the ovary is covered by first germinal epithelium from outside, and then you can see the tonica albogena, the capsule of the ovary. The ovary has one indented part, which is the hilum. From this hilum, you can see the ovarian ligament come, uh, sorry, the ovarian artery come inside, and the ovarian vein leave the ovary. And inside the ovary, we have two regions. The region which is located around is called cortex of the ovary, and the region which we have in the center is called medulla. In the cortex, you see different structures. All of them are called ovarian follicles. But these ovarian follicles are not the same in their shape. They have different structures because they are in different uh, stages of uh, development. And after this ovarian follicle, uh, you can see uh, the other structures, which we call them corpus luteum and corpus albicans, which I will talk about them later for you. So this is the structure of the ovary. Uh, please turn off your microphone. This is 
the other picture which we have uh, for uh, the ovary. In this picture, you can see uh, the cortex of the ovary. The cortex is located outside, and in the center, you can see the medulla. In the cortex, we have ovarian follicle, and the medulla is composed of connective tissue, blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics. These are, uh, and this part is called the hilum of the ovary. And this is the germinal epithelium, the simple cuboidal to low columnar epithelium, which is located around the ovary. We don't know exactly the function of germinal epithelium. The name is germinal, but actually it cannot do any germination. Um, and it's only the epithelium which is located around the ovary. And uh, this part, uh, let me um, show it to you. Uh, this part is the capsule or the tonica albogena of um, the ovary, and it's located around uh, the ovary. So let me, tonica albogena. And this is the germinal epithelium. This is the other picture of the ovary, the germinal epithelium, and the tonic albogena cover the ovary from outside. After that, you can see the cortex of the ovary. Uh, this part is uh, the cortex. The cortex of the ovary is the part where you can see uh, the follicles in different stages of development. And the next part is called medulla. Uh, this black part is the medulla of the ovary, which is located inside. Now, I want to talk about the ovarian follicle. Before I start talking about the ovarian follicle and their development, you need to know that the ovarian follicle are composed of two structures, two cells. One of these cells is called oocyte. The oocyte is located in the center of the ovarian follicle, and only we have one oocyte in, ovary, in one ovarian follicle. And the other cell is called follicular cell um, or a granulosa cell. These are the cells which are located around the oocyte. And I will show you these structures uh, in the next picture. Only we have one oocyte, but we have a group of follicular cells and granulosa cells. I will talk about these um, uh, structures, the mature follicle and the corpus luteum uh, later for you. Look at this picture. In this picture, you can see the different stages of development for ovarian follicle. All of this process, which you have in this picture, happen in the first half of menstrual cycle. Menstrual cycle is a cycle which we have in female. It's a uh, human. This cycle lasts about 28 days. Uh, the 28 is the average of the menstrual cycle. Sometimes the length of this cycle is less than 28, and sometimes it's more than 28. But the average is 28 days. And all of this happening happen in the first half in the first 14 days. The first structure which I want to show you is this one, which we call it primordial follicle. Before I start talking about primordial follicle, you need to know that all of these blue structures, the blue round cells, which you have in all of these follicles is oocyte, and the yellow cells which are located around this um, oocyte is called granulosa cell. So this oocyte and the granulosa cells around is called one follicle. And in all of them, you can see the oocyte in blue and granulosa cells in yellow. The first cell which we have here is called primordial follicle. In the primordial follicle, you have one oocyte in the center and a group of granulosa cells 
which are flat the, or a squamous around it. This is primordial follicle. A group of primordial follicle start to grow and they can change to the next step which we call it primary follicle. The difference between primordial and primary is the shape and the number of granulosa cells. The shape of granulosa cells become cuboidal and their number increase. Here you only have four granulosa cells and in the next picture you can see many of granulosa cells. It means that they start to do mitotic division and also uh, they uh, start to <clears throat> grow in uh, their size and you can see their size uh, here so the next step uh, is called primary follicle so first we have primordial and after that we have primary follicle the primary follicle at first has only one layer of cells we call it unilaminar primary follicle or early primary follicle. After that, you see the number of these granulosa cells increase and they are arranged in more than one layer. When they arrange in more than one layer in a stage three and a stage four and five, we call them primary follicle again, but they are multilaminar. So what happened here? First, we have primordial follicle with flat uh, follicular or granulosa cells around. Then the granulosa cells become cuboidal. Their number increase, but still they are in one layer. We call them unilaminar primary follicle. And after that, this unilaminar primary follicle uh, change to a multilaminar primary follicle as you see in this picture and the number of the layers increase and increase after that in a stage six you can see some cavities uh, in this uh, follicle the appearance of these cavities change the step in the development now we call this follicle secondary follicle these cavities are called antrum and this antrum uh, is actually the cavities which are filled with the follicular fluid the fluid is a fluid which is secreted by these granulosa cells the amount of this fluid increase and increase and as you see here um, all of the cavities attach together and it can make a very large cavity when you see only one large cavity your follicle change to graphian follicle or mature follicle and this is the mature follicle which you have then the pressure of this follicular fluid increase and increase. It makes pressure on the wall of the follicle. As you see here, the wall and your follicle rupture and the oocyte is released. This oocyte which is released here um, at uh, day 14 or in the uh, ovulation a day. And after that, this ovulated oocyte can um, go to the oviduct and then fertilization may take place, which I will talk about it uh, later for you. So in this picture, you can see all the stages of development. First, we have primordial follicle, then we have primary follicle our primary follicle is unilaminar first and then the primary follicles become multilaminar the number of layers of the granulosa cells increase and increase after that you can see the appearance of the antrum in this step we call it secondary follicle and in the antrum we have follicular fluid all of these follicular fluid and the antrums are uh, unique with each other and they can make a large cavity which is uh, which can make the graphene follicle for us the pressure and the amount of 
fluid increase it can make pressure on the wall of this follicle and by this pressure uh, the follicle ruptured and the oocyte is released this process is called ovulation which i will talk about it uh, next time again uh, in this picture you can see the primordial follicle first you have this cell uh, let me uh, mark the cell for you here uh, this cell which you see here uh, is called oocyte so uh, this cell is the oocyte and here you can see the nucleus of the cell this is the nucleus and uh, in the center you can see the nucleoli and you have one layer of follicular cell or granulosa cell around so the cells are flat and our follicle is called primordial follicle around the primordial follicle you have the basement membrane and after that you have the stromal cell the stromal cell are the connective tissue the fibroblast and the collagen fibers which you have uh, in the background of your ovary this um, follicular, uh, this primordial follicle uh, starts to grow. I will talk about uh, this uh, slide uh, later for you. Uh, they uh, start uh, to grow. First, you need to know that uh, during embryonic period, uh, we have creation of many, many primordial follicles. At the time of puberty, we only have 1,400 uh, primordial follicle. And um, at, during uh, the lifetime, only 400 of these follicle start to grow and do uh, ovulation. So during the reproductive li lifetime, only 400 follicle start to grow and the others are regress and die during this um, reproductive life and i will talk about it for you uh, later now look at the next uh, picture in this picture you can see the primary follicle again this cell is called oocyte this is the nucleus and here you can see the nucleoli and you have many layers of granulosa cells around your oocyte this is the late primary follicle or multilaminar primary follicle during this step from the granulosa cells and from the oocyte we have secretion of a glycoprotein this glycoprotein is this purple layer and we call this glycoprotein zona plucida so the zona plucida is a glycoprotein which is secreted from the oocyte and the granulosa cell and uh, it make uh, a sheet around the oocyte this zona plucida is very important at the time of fertilization at the time of fertilization when the head of the first sperm reach the oocyte and can solve this zona plucida and come inside the oocyte this zona plucida become very thick and impermeable to the other sperms so polyspermy doesn't take place uh, during fertilization only one sperm can come inside and can make fertilization so here uh, again uh, you can see uh, the follicle our follicle is this part it starts from uh, here as you see here in the black arrow it starts from here and ends here you have one oocyte in the center and a group of granulosa cells around and your granulosa cells are located in different are arranged in different layers they don't have any space between themselves so your follicle is primary and as you have many layers we call it late primary follicle 
after that, you can see the connective tissue of your ovary around uh, your follicle. This connective tissue start to uh, sorry. This connective tissue start uh, to uh, become uh, organized here. Uh, here is the connective tissue which you have. And as you see here, one layer of this connective tissue uh, is more cellular, this layer, and it's located just after the basement membrane. And the other layer is located outside, and it's, it has more fibers, more collagen fibers. This connective tissue, which you have around the follicle, the late primary follicle, is called teca folliculi. This teca folliculi is important at the time of ovulation. This teca folliculi can provide many blood vessels, as you see here, for your follicle to make enough nutrient, to bring enough nutrient for your follicle. The next step is secondary follicle. As you see in this picture, you have your oocyte, you have the purple uh, zona pellucida around your oocyte, you have many, many granulosa cells here, and you have a cavity which is antrum. And in this antrum, you have follicular fluid. I told you that. When you have the appearance of the antrum, your follicle change from primary to secondary follicle. When you have secondary follicle, the teca folliculi which you have around your, uh, this is the teca folliculi, the teca folliculi which you have around your follicle become more organized. The out, outer layer of your teca folliculi is called teca externa. It contains more collagen fibers, more fibroblasts, and more blood vessels. And the internal layer uh, is called teca interna, which is more cellular, and you can see these gray cells in teca interna. This is the secondary follicle. Still, we have secondary follicle in this picture. In this picture, you can see uh, your oocyte here. You can see the antrum, but you have more than one antrum here, so you are still uh, in the stage of secondary follicle. All of the cells which you have around your follicle is called granulosa cells, and the uh, pressure of this fluid uh, which you have inside the antrum uh, can press and can move your oocyte from the center to the marginal zone. So you see that your follicle, uh, sorry, your oocyte is not in the center anymore. And after that, you can see uh, this layer uh, around your follicle, this layer, uh, which I mark it with um, uh, a black arrow, is the teca folliculi, which you have around your follicle. And pay attention, uh, this uh, blue layer which you have around your oocyte is the zona pellucida. Now you have the last layer, uh, the last stage, which we call it mature or graphian follicle. In the mature or graphian follicle, you have your oocyte. It's not center, it's eccentric, it's near the margin of your follicle. You have a group of granulosa cells which are located around, and we have um, um, some layers of granulosa cells around our uh, primary, um, I'm sorry, around our oocyte, and uh, this group of Granulosa cells here has a name which we call them corona radiata. Let me um, mark this corona radiata here for you. We call it corona radiata. Uh, this purple layer is the zona pellucida which you have around your oocyte, and all of the cells which you have in your follicle except your oocyte are granulosa cells. This is the antrum which is filled with follicular fluid. And here, 
you can see the teca layer, the teca folliculi, teca interna inside and teca externa uh, outside. <coughs> This is the mature or graphian follicle, and you need to know that this mature follicle come to the outermost part of your cortex, and it's like a blister which pimple up uh, from the surface of uh, the ovary. It's ready to do ovulation. And by ovulation, your uh, mature follicle rupture and the oocyte is released. And this is uh, the cortex of the ovary. As I told you before, our ovary is covered by germinal epithelium from outside. Then we have a capsule of the ovary, which is tonica albogena, and we have different follicles in different stages. The smallest follicle are primordial follicle. Their numbers are many. As I told you, uh, we may have uh, more than um, four uh, million a primordial follicle um, before puberty but after puberty their number change most of them regress and we have about 40 hundred uh, sorry, 40,000, and uh, after that, during the lifetime, um, reproductive lifetime, uh, this uh, primordial follicle uh, change to 400 primordial follicle. This primordial follicle can make primary follicle. This is one of the primary follicle which I can find in this picture. This is the other primary follicle which we have. This primary follicle uh, starts to grow and they uh, can more layer of granulosa cells and they can make primary follicle uh, which is multilaminar or late primary follicle then they change to secondary follicle and after that they change to graphene follicle which I don't have uh, the picture uh, here after we have ovulation, when uh, the follicle uh, lose its oocyte at the time of ovulation, uh, the granulosa cells and the teca layers remain in the ovary. The granulosa cells and teca layer, which remain in the ovary, and I mark it with black here, is called corpus luteum. Corpus luteum remain in the ovary. If fertilization take place and we have pregnancy, this corpus luteum make progesterone to maintain the pregnancy for us for about um, two to three months. If we don't have any fertilization and we don't have pregnancy, this corpus luteum regress and it can make the other body, which we call it corpus albicans and I will talk about these two structures next time more for you. Now I want to talk about oogenesis. I hope you remember uh, spermatogenesis in male reproductive system. Uh, I hope you remember that during spermatogenesis, first we have a cell which we call it a spermatogonia. This is spermatogonia do mitotic division all the time, and we have um, some of them can differentiate to primary spermatocyte and some of them remain as the germ cell. The primary spermatocyte start doing my, uh, meiotic division. First we have two secondary spermatocytes from each primary spermatocyte and after that we have four sperm or four spermatid. And our spermatid need to do a spermiogenesis to form a sperm for us. So from each primary spermatocyte, we have four sperm. Now I want to talk about oogenesis, which is completely different from spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis can start from the time of puberty and it ends at a time of death. But oogenesis is completely different. Oogenesis starts from fetal puberty. When we have baby, um, sorry, when we have a fetus, which is girl, in the uterus of her mother, uh, the oogenesis start. First, we have a cell which we call it oogonium. This oogonium do mitotic division and their number increase. 
Some of them differentiate to primary oocytes. And during fetal development, pay attention, during fetal development, this primary oocyte start its meiosis. You know that in each of the meiosis, first we have prophase, then we have metaphase, then we have anaphase, and the last step is called telophase. Our primary oocyte starts meiosis, but it has stopped in prophase one. During childhood and until uh, puberty, we don't have any change, and our primary oocyte, which starts its meiosis, stops in prophase one. After puberty, again, this meiosis a start and it wants to continue. This, <clears throat> the result of uh, the first meiosis is two cells, as you see here. One of them is called secondary oocyte. The other one is called first polar body. You see that these two cells are different in their sizes. One of them can get more cytoplasm, the other one can get less cytoplasm. The bigger cell is called secondary oocyte. The secondary oocyte starts doing the next meiosis. And the result of next meiosis is this. It has stretch meiosis, but the uh, meiosis is not complete again. It stops in metaphase two, and ovulation takes place when we have um, this um, secondary oocyte, which is stopped in metaphase two. If fertilization takes place, if a sperm and secondary oocyte combine together and um, a sperm enter this oocyte, the second step of meiosis complete and we have uh, the <coughs> ovum, as you see here. And this ovum, in this ovum, uh, the nucleus of female sex cell and the nucleus of male sex cell combine together and they can make zygote. So what happened here? Uh, what is the difference between oogenesis and spermatogenesis? The difference is this. First, spermatogenesis starts at the time of puberty and ends at the time of death. But oogenesis starts during fetal period and it stops at the time of menopause, which is uh, 45, 50, 55 years old in the female. The next difference is this in spermatogenesis. From each primary spermatocyte, we have four sperm. But in the oogenesis, from each primary oocyte, we only have one um, cell, which you can see here. And then, um, and this cell is called ovum. And um, this, these are the differences here. The other thing which I, I need to talk about is the first polar body, which we have here. This first polar body uh, sometimes regress and sometimes it can continue its meiosis and make these two cells, and these two cells are die and regress. We don't need them. And when our meiosis two complete, again, we have the second polar body, uh, which regress and die uh, in the uh, oviduct. This is uh, the next picture, uh, which uh, you can see uh, all of this happening. You have about three different steps here with three different colors. First, we have fetal period. And as I told you before, during fetal period, we have orgonium. These orgonium do mitotic division and they can make primary oocyte. These primary oocytes start doing their meiosis, and this meiosis starts, but it has stopped in prophase one. Uh, 
you see that during childhood nothing happened and after puberty the primary oocyte which is still in prophase one continue its meiosis the result of meiosis one is one secondary oocyte and one polar body the secondary oocyte is bigger than the first polar body the secondary oocyte start doing the second meiosis. The second meiosis starts, but it never completes in the ovary. Ovulation, as you see here, take place, and this secondary oocyte, which is in metaphase two, go to the oviduct. If fertilization take place, if the head of the sperm come to this secondary oocyte then the uh, meiosis complete we have ovum and the sperm here these two cells combine together and they can make zygote and if we don't have any uh, fertilization the secondary oocyte which is in metaphase 2 regress and die in female reproductive system you need to know that when we have um, uh, ovulation this secondary oocyte can remain in the female reproductive system for 24 to 36 hours in the first 24 hours, uh, this is the best time to do fertilization. If fertilization doesn't take place during this time, the secondary oocyte is very old and it cannot uh, do fertilization completely. If fertilization takes place, sometimes the zygote is very weak and it cannot do uh, implantation. So the best time for fertilization is 24 up to 24 hours after uh, ovulation. Next time when I want to talk about pregnancy more for you, I will talk about this part uh, more. The next part of uh, female reproductive uh, system are two uterine tubes or fallopian tubes. Uh, let me show you this uh, uterine tube. In this picture, you can see uh, the uterine tube. The uterine tube has three important parts. The first part is called infundibulum. The infundibulum is the funnel shape structure. The infundibulum has many finger like projections. They, they are called fimbria, and these fimbria can start doing a movement and vibration at the time of ovulation. By this vibration, they can catch the ovulated oocyte. The oocyte come uh, to the infundibulum, and after infundibulum, it moves in the ampulla, the longest part of the oviduct. In the ampulla, we have um, two different types of cells. Some of our cells contain cilia. These cilia can beat forward and backward and help the oocyte to move in the <clears throat> oviduct and some of the cells uh, are called peg cells and these peg cells uh, uh, contain microvilli by the microvilli they can do secretion of nutrient for this oocyte around the oocyte which is um, ovulated we have a group of i told you that corona radiata cell the corona radiata are the group of granulosa cells which support and make a sheet around our uh, oocyte. And by this um, corona radiata, we have more friction between the oocyte and between these oviducts. By this friction, our oocyte uh, cannot move very fast in the oviduct. So it has enough time, about 25 hours, to be here. And if the sperm uh, come inside and go up in the oviduct, fertilization should take place here. Pay attention. The best site of fertilization is the ampulla. And all the times we have this question, where is the best um, part of fertilization in the female reproductive system? And this is the ampulla. 
And the last part of the aviduct is this thick part, thick and uh, uh, short part, which we call it isthmus. And isthmus can make connection between uh, the aviduct and the uterus. These are the different parts which we have uh, for uh, the aviduct. And uh, the oviduct or uterine tube uh, has uh, three layers histologically. Uh, one of uh, this layer is called tonica mucosa. One of them is called tonica muscularis. And the last layer is called tonica serosa. The epithelium here is simple ciliated columnar epithelium. This simple ciliated columnar epithelium contains some columnar cell with cilia. This cilia can help the fertilized ovum or secondary oocyte to move toward the uterus. And the other type of cell is uh, called peg cell. The peg cells are the cells with microvilli uh, and uh, they are in the tube and they can secrete a fluid which can provide enough nutrients for our uh, ovum. And uh, here you can see these two types of cells. Uh, the cells, the columnar cells with their cilia are shown with a yellow color, and the peg cell with microvilli, uh, and they don't have any cilia with blue color. These are the cells that we have uh, in the epithelium here. And the next structure is called uterus. The uterus is a part of pathway for a sperm uh, which is deposited in the vagina to reach the uterine tube. Uh, at the time of uh, intercourse, uh, due to the presence of prostaglandins in the semen, we have some uh, contraction against gravity, which we call it anti-gravity contraction. Uh, it means that the contraction starts from the neck of the uterus and come up to the fundus. By this type of contraction, the sperm can come up in the wall of uterus, in the sorry, lumen of the uterus, and it can enter the oviduct. Uh, the uterus is the site of implantation. For the fertilized ovum, it's a site of development for the fetus during pregnancy, and labor takes place by contraction of the muscle in the wall of uterus. In this picture, you can see the different parts of the uterus. First, we have fundus here, then we have body of the uterus, and the last part is called neck or cervix. Let me uh, mark the cervix here for you. This part is called cervix. The cervix has two important parts. One part, um, sorry, two opening. One opening is here, which we call it internal opening or internal os. And the other opening is here, we call it external opening or external os. The cervix is a neck of the uterus. In the cervix, we have uh, some folds uh, in the tonica mucosa. These folds can go interdigitate with each other, and at the time of pregnancy, they can close the opening of uterus. From the mucosa of the cervix, we have release of uh, a mucus, which we call it cervical seal. This mucus is very thick, and it doesn't let anything to come to the uterus at time of pregnancy. So these are the different parts which we have uh, for the uterus. Uh, and you need to know that the cervix has one invagination, as you see here, in the vagina. This invagination can make some poaches uh, here. These poaches are called lateral fornix. And uh, pay attention, maybe we have this question in our lab. Histologically, we have three layers in the uterus. The outermost layer of the uterus is called perimetrium or tonica cervix. The middle layer of the uterus 
is called myometrium and it contains three layers of smooth muscles and the innermost layer is endometrium actually this is the tonica mucosa and endometrium itself has two important layers one layer of endometrium is called stratum functionalis. This layer is shed and a slough of each month during menstruation and bleeding. And the other layer, the deeper layer, is called stratum basalis. This is the permanent layer, and each month it can make a new stratum functionalis after uh, bleeding and after this layer, a slough. If uh, you look at uh, this picture, uh, you can see uh, the endometrium. All of this part is endometrium. Uh, the outermost layer, uh, let me mark it for you. The outermost layer here is called stratum functionalis, and the inner part is called stratum basalis. The stratum uh, functionalis is covered by simple columnar epithelium from outside. This simple columnar epithelium can invaginate inside and it can um, make um, <clears throat> endometrial gland. These glands are very important for nourishment of the fetus. I will talk about it later for you. Uh, and the deeper layer is called uh, a stratum uh, basalis. Each month, this stratum functionalis is shed, and a stratum basalis can make it again. In this picture, you can see endometrium in two different weeks. The first picture is the second week of a uh, menstrual cycle, and the next picture is the third week. And you see that, uh, let me show you, this is a stratum functionalis in the second week and this is a stratum functionalis in the third week the stratum functionalis start growing and growing and when we have ments or bleeding all of this layer is a slough off and shed and a stratum basalis can make it so the stratum basalis is the permanent layer which we have uh, we have uh, many blood vessels which come to the uterus and uh, supply the uterus. First, we need to know that the uterine arteriole come out of internal iliac artery. Do you remember in the opening of the pelvis, we have the abdominal aorta divided into two branches which are common iliac. Then the common iliac uh, can give two branches inside the pelvis which are internal iliac arteries. The internal iliac arteries can make uterine arteriole in right and left side. Uterine arteriole can make the arcuate arteries, and the arcuate arteries can nourish uh, the myometrium. Then, from the arcuate arteries, we have some radial arteries. These radial arteries continue with a straight arteriole. The straight arteriole are located in the stratum basalis and they can make many many uh, <clears throat> branches to a stratum functionalis which we call them a spiral arteries and during men's these spiral arteries are tear and bleeding take place from them we need many blood vessels here in the uterus because these blood vessels want to make connection with the fetus when we have pregnancy. So the presence of these blood vessels in the uterus are very important. Um, and uh, as I told you, the cervix have many secretory cells. They can make cervical mucose. And this cervical mucose chemically is uh, very hospitable to the sperm. Uh, it's less viscous and also it's more alkaline and help the sperm to move uh, in the root and reach itself to the uh, oocyte um, when we have ovulation. Uh, this Secretion contains water, 
glycoprotein, lipids, enzyme, and inorganic salt. They help nourish the sperm and they can help a process which we call it capacitation. Capacitation means that we have some functional changes in the sperm. These functional changes is this. First, the movement of the sperm increase uh, by uh, its flagella and the other one is the enzyme which we have in the acrosome become very functional and active. They can release, they can solve the granulosa cells and the zona placida and they can reach themselves to the oocyte. And by this reaching, they can do fertilization. So it's very important. The next part which we have in female reproductive system is the fibromuscular tube. Uh, it's here and we call it vagina. This vagina is uh, lined by a stratified squamous epithelium. It starts from cervix and continues to the external part of uh, female reproductive system. Uh, this is the simple, uh, sorry, the stratified squamous epithelium which you have for the vagina. And uh, we have uh, a thick layer of muscles here. The inner layer of muscle uh, is uh, longitudinal and the outer layer is uh, circular muscles. <clears throat> so outer circular and inner longitudinal. Uh, these muscles um, are very thick. And um, the other thing which is important is uh, we have many folds or rugae inside uh, the vagina. These folds become open and allow the vagina to become a stretch at the time of childbirth and intercourse. And we have a very thin fold of uh, mucus which is highly vascularized in the inferior end of the vagina. This thin mucus is called hymen. And uh, the other part, the last part of female reproductive system is called the vulva or uh, pudendum. Uh, and the, the vulva is uh, the external genitalia. We have different parts here. The first part is called mons pubis. The mons pubis is the uh, elevation of adipose tissue which is covered by the skin and hair. Uh, we have two labia here, labia minora and majora. The next part is called clitoris. Clitoris is very similar in its uh, structure to the penis. Uh, it's um, erectile tissue um, and it contains many, many blood sinusoids. And uh, the other part is called the vestibule. The vestibule is composed of the hymen, that thin um, membrane which we have, uh, the vaginal orifice, external urethral orifice, and some uh, the duct of some glands, which we call them vestibular uh, glands. And uh, the other part which uh, I want to talk about is uh, the mammary gland. The mammary gland uh, can make a secret and um, the ejection of uh, the milk. Um, each breast uh, has, uh, let me show you first the picture. Uh, each breast uh, has one pigmented projection, which we call it nipple. And the circular pigmented part uh, of the skin which surround the nipple is called areola. So here you can see the nipple and the areola. The areola is um, uh, a little uh, rough in its appearance. Uh, it's not soft because we have many uh, sebaceous gland or oiled gland here. Uh, we have uh, many suspensory ligaments uh, here. This suspensory ligament of the breast, uh, the other name is Cooper's ligament. Uh, this ligament can suspend the breast um, from uh, the muscles which we have um, on the surface of our chest. And uh, by aging, uh, this uh, ligament become loosened and loosened. Some <clears throat> Supportive bra can help um, making delay for loosening of uh, this uh, ligament here. Uh, 
Uh, within each breast, uh, um, we have mammary gland. The mammary gland is actually the pseudoferrous gland or the sweat gland, and it can make milk. A mammary gland cons consists of 15 to 20 uh, lobes and or 20 compartment and between them we have many many adipose tissue around these um, lobes we have myoepithelial cells and these myoepithelial cells can do contraction and by contraction of this gland the milk can go out each of uh, these parts of the gland have their own lactoferrous duct here and you see that we have many ducts and many opening in uh, the nipple and uh, it has a reason because if one of these opening is closed one of these ducts is closed the others can uh, help the milk to do ejection and uh, can come uh, out and this is about uh, this uh, structure and all of the information which you need is uh, here. Uh, next time, I will talk about the hormonal control of the female uh, reproductive system.